As the last Roman garrison sailed away from these shores, the remaining Britons were left leaderless and at the mercy of invaders from the north and across the seas. During these dark times, a warrior king emerged, a king of all the Britons, and at the Battle of Baden Hill, he halted the enemy advance. His name was Ambrosius Aurelianus, sometimes recorded as Artorius or Arthur. King Arthur has been a central figure in the early histories of Britain, but in fact he very possibly never existed, and the familiar cast of characters and items we associate with him, Lancelot, Merlin, Excalibur and the Holy Grail were added in later retellings. Like Arthurian legends, the 600 or so years between the departure of the Romans and the arrival of the Normans is a mix of historical facts and fictions. Most written sources were recorded far from British shores or long after the events they described. This has led to the period being labelled by some historians as the Dark Ages. Today, we shall shed some light on them. Civilization appeared to leave Britain when the Romans did. Construction regressed, trade withered, violence increased. This was because civilization requires organization. To make stone houses, you need miners to quarry the rock. For currency, you need craftsmen to mint the coins. To have law and order, you need magistrates to pass judgments and constables to enforce them. All these skilled people required wages, and that means taxes. And taxes can only be collected by an effective government. When the Romans left Britain, there was no effective government to be had. Britain was ripe for invasion, and invaded it was from all directions. The Scots, who were originally natives of Ireland, attacked from the west, the Picts from the north and the Saxons from the east and south. Of these tribes, it was the Saxons, together with other Germanic tribes like the Angles and Jutes, who were most successful. They were mercenaries, who had actually been invited by the native Britons to help defend against the Picts and the Scots. But upon arrival, they saw how weak the Britons were and took the land for themselves. As the Anglo-Saxons pushed slowly westward, so too the native British either gave ground or submitted to the newcomers. By 660, the Anglo-Saxons controlled most of Britain. Only Wales, Scotland and Cornwall were still ruled by Celts and Britons. The newcomers brought with them their own language, what became Old English, the ancestor of our speech today. But they did not put much value in reading and writing, only using rudimentary symbols called runes when necessary. Instead, the written accounts of this time come from Christian monks such as Gildas and Bede, who were less than kind in their descriptions of these invaders. Historians have had to look to other sources to gauge what happened. Place names can provide clues as to where these tribes settled. The word Ton and Ham are Anglo-Saxon for village, hence their inclusion in towns like Luton and Birmingham. Wicks were trading ports, as in Sandwich and Ipswich. East Anglia was named for the Angles, and the Saxons populated the East, Essex, South, Sussex, and West, Wessex, of Southern Britain. Despite their mercenary beginnings, the Anglo-Saxon settlers lived as farmers, and many Britons probably farmed alongside them and so were gradually absorbed into their society. Everyone dressed alike, even kings and nobles just wore more luxurious versions of the same clothes everyone else wore. These were loose-fitting tunics fixed with brooches because more snug-fitting garments required buttons which had not yet been invented. Houses were simple wooden buildings. Animals shared the living space which helped keep the house warm in winter and the animals safe from wolves and bears. Being farmers with no use for towns, the Anglo-Saxons chose not to occupy the abandoned Roman buildings. Each farmer usually owned enough land to grow food for a family, an area known as a hide. The man who owned it was called a churl. A man who owned more than five hides of land was called a thane, similar to a knight in later times. Slaves also existed, many of whom were Britons or who had committed crimes, although sometimes very poor churls sold themselves into slavery as their new masters would be obliged to feed them. Women were responsible for spinning and weaving thread, as well as sewing. They also brewed and served alcohol, river water usually being too dirty to drink. Some royal and noble women would have had the responsibility of looking after big estates and organising large social events. One famous woman, Hilda of Whitby, was so well known for her learning and wisdom that kings went to her for advice. Local rulers, called underkings or eldermen, resided in halls, where they dispensed to their followers the treasures won from plunder and tribute. These halls would often host huge feasts. Everyone drank mead and beer, ate roasted meat, exchanged presents and told stories. In place of writing, an oral tradition developed, which kept alive tales passed from generation to generation by memory and recitation, usually in song which was easier to learn. The most famous of these, and later one of the first to be written down in Old English, was the story of Beowulf, a mighty Scandinavian warrior prince. In that story, there is much emphasis on the wealth of kings. Historians had assumed these treasures 
spoken of were embellished until a burial site at Sutton Hoo in East Anglia was discovered in the 1930s which proved it was no exaggeration. The site was filled with fabulous treasures including coins from France, silver bowls from the Mediterranean and cloth from Syria. Whilst Christianity had first been introduced to Britain in Roman times and had survived on the peripheries of the island, those remaining Christian Britons, such as the Welsh, had been too busy fighting the Anglo-Saxons to try to convert them. The Anglo-Saxons were pagan, they worshipped gods like Woden and Thunor. Many of the days of the week come from these deities. For instance, Frigg, the goddess of love, gave her name to Friday. But by the late 6th century, fairly peaceful Anglo-Saxon kingdoms had emerged and church leaders in Ireland and Italy saw their chance to bring back Christianity to all of Britain. In 596, Pope Gregory supposedly sent his missionary Augustine to Britain after remarking on Anglo-Saxon slaves he'd seen in Rome as not being Angles but angels. Christianity quickly spread through Britain. Many monasteries were founded at this time, the first being on the Scottish island of Iona in 563. New vocations opened up for both men and women serving the church. Large monasteries had rooms called scriptoriums where monks painstakingly copied out religious educational texts into decorated books known as manuscripts, the Lindisfarne Gospels being some of the most famous. These contributed to a rise in education and the written word, some of which was in Old English, but most was in Latin. Latin had become the language for most official business in Britain and much of Europe, which allowed for more cultural exchanges. Letters survive to this day between the Anglo-Saxon King Offa of Mercia and Emperor Charlemagne who ruled much of Western Europe. Writing allows laws to be codified. King Ethelbert of Kent was the first king to publish written laws. In a time without prisons, most punishments involved fines, mutilations or execution. If a family member was killed, for example, it was considered fair to kill someone from the murderer's family in return. This system was called Virgild. Writing also better facilitated trade. King Offa was the first king to reintroduce coins to Britain and he became wealthy enough to afford the construction of a huge earthenwork boundary called Offa's Dyke to protect against attacking Welsh Britons. Trade allowed for the rebirth of towns. Roman towns such as London were dusted down and reoccupied, as were others such as York, where archaeological research has revealed tightly packed long and thin houses like terrace housing with workshops at the back. Tools found there originated from Norway and Denmark, as well as silks from Turkey and coins from Uzbekistan. But this revitalised York was not an Anglo-Saxon town. From the 8th century onwards, a new group of people had begun to settle and overrun Britain's east coast and had made York their capital, the Vikings. Since the departure of the Romans, seven Anglo-Saxon kingdoms, the Heparchy, had emerged. Kent, Essex, Sussex, East Anglia, Northumbria, Mercia and Wessex. These kingdoms' powers waxed and waned, but gradually over time the smaller kingdoms had been absorbed by the greater ones. The new Viking threat looked likely to end this Anglo-Saxon unification. The Vikings were people from the coastal lands of Scandinavia and had struck out across Europe, Africa and Asia. The most intrepid of them had even reached North America hundreds of years before Columbus did. As they could appear at any point along Britain's coast, the Anglo-Saxons struggled to defend against them. Eventually, the Viking raids became so frequent that they chose to settle in Britain over the winter rather than returning to their homelands. The Scottish had better luck defending their territory from Viking encroachment. The rugged landscape that had hindered the Romans also hindered the Vikings. In 843, King Kenneth MacAlpine united virtually all of Scotland north of the Forth, calling his kingdom Alba. The Anglo-Saxons eventually rallied under the leadership of Alfred of Wessex, otherwise known as Alfred the Great, who checked the Vikings' advance and preserved Wessex's independence. His successors gradually drove the Danes out and in the process became kings of a single unified England. Alfred's grandson Ethelstan is generally seen as the first king of England. But the Viking threat was not yet gone, rather that when they came back again, the prize at stake was not a small kingdom but the whole of England. In 1016, the Viking Canute did in fact conquer all of the country and added it to his northern empire that included Denmark and Norway. However, this empire only lasted as long as Canute did, and after some years of turmoil, the Anglo-Saxon, Norman raised, son of Canute's wife by another man, Edward the Confessor, became king. Edward was popular with ordinary people, but didn't get on with his nobles, in particular the Earl Godwin of Wessex and his heir Harold Godwinson. One significant action of Edward's reign was his decision to set up an administrative centre on the marshy island of the Thames that he named Westminster, a mile and a half from the old Roman city. London became a hub of trade, whilst Westminster became a base of government, a division that holds true to this day. 
This period begins with Rome's sacking by the Visigoths in 410, ending any chance of the Romans returning to Britain. By 450, neighbouring tribes were attacking the Britons. By 660, all of Britain except Scotland, Wales and Cornwall were in Anglo-Saxon hands. Around this time, Christianity was spreading across Britain. The Vikings first raided the east of Britain in 789 and reached their greatest extent a century later, before King Alfred began to push them back. His grandson Ethelstan became the first true king of England in 927, but the Vikings returned to add England to Canute's northern empire in 1016. This empire was short-lived, however, and from 1042 the Anglo-Saxon Edward was king. His death in 1066 triggered the Norman invasion and the start of the next chapter in British history.